Oh, there we go. I was expecting, I was expecting, a, you know, a, a black muscle shirt, but we'll take it, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's, it's now it's now I'm business casual now because it's lunchtime. Uh, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna go farm to fork on some lunch. So, David, my cohort, please take it away. Eric, thank you. It's absolutely awesome to be here. And uh, yeah, looking very dapper there, actually. I'm a, I don't know what happened to the shirt earlier, but there you go. Um, hopefully it'll make a reappearance. Um, okay, what have we got? We've got farm to fork today. And, um, you know, farm to, fork, farm to fork is something that started a few years ago, as says, perhaps a bit of a quirky idea, even a marketing platform, but it's really grown into one of the most important and vital culinary movements in the hospitality industry. And I'm absolutely delighted today to have with me four or five of those pioneers, those pioneers um, in the industry. And I'm just going to run through quickly who we've got. We've got, we're going to be kicking off with Chef Bo. Chef Bo is the co-founder of the multi-award winning and Michelin starred Bolan restaurant in Bangkok. Bolan started doing sustainability, bringing local sourcing into its into its recipes, into its uh, into its um, uh, culinary performance experience, if you like, uh, many years ago, actually. But they are very much now in trend, and, and uh, Chef uh, Chef Bo is going to have some great um, things to say uh, a little bit later. Then we've got Chef Jimmy. Chef Jimmy is from Phuket's first Michelin-starred restaurant, Prue at Trisara, and uh, and he's going to be taking us into his garden. Um, I think it's raining a little bit at the moment, but he's going to be taking us to, into his garden where he can be wearing a Macintosh, but let's have a look at that in a second. Then we've got James Noble. James Noble is chef and founder of Boutique Farmers, and he's co-founder of the Origin Farm Project, which is a project which, uh, in collaboration with Banyan Tree, and it's in Chiang Mai. And what it does essentially is prepare tunnels of non-indigenous produce and then supply restaurants all over Thailand and um, outside of Thailand too. And a number of the Michelin stars will hear from James in a moment. Um, then we have Jason Friedman. Jason Friedman is managing director of JN, JM, excuse me, Friedman and Co. And he's behind, you know, again, multi um, uh, award winning projects, Shintamani Wild, Rosewood, Lorne Prabang, um, Puchai Sai in uh, uh, Chiang Mai, in which they've really, really introduced incredible activities, um, artisanal crops, um, and all sorts of um, uh, sorts of guest experiences, but really, really good, sustainable, organic, farm to fork stuff um, that comes straight to your plate when you're there, um, and can also be delivered to you. So we're looking forward to hearing from Jason in just a sec. And rounding off, we're gonna have Bill Barnett. Bill Barnett needs, needs little introduction. He is managing director of C9 Hotel Works, and he's gonna wrap things up for us. So, um, uh, so stick with us, and uh, this is what we've got um, uh, coming up for you. Um, first up, we have Chef Bo. Hi there, Fist is absolutely delighted to welcome restaurant redefining and Michelin, Michelin, excuse me, Michelin starred chef um, Chef Bo from Bolan Restaurant. Chef Bo, welcome. Hi, sorry. Just um, uh, for those who don't know, Bolan is about a decade old, has one Michelin star, is consistently a high flyer on Asia's 50 best, and, um, and is about to possibly throw it all away, completely redefining its concept. Um, Chef Bo, tell us a little bit about what's happening at Bolan at the moment. Uh, Bolan at the moment, we bring in other people so that we can have like a mixed use of other venues. We have a restaurant called Earth in the old city that, that now we move them in as well. And then we're promoting Bolan Grocers, which is like part of our Bolan forever. But then, you know, with the COVID and everything, people cook at home more so that we uh, more or less reintroduce the Bolan Grocer produce. And also we have the Westland with the bar who who share the same philosophy, and that will be part of the Bolan as well. And I think what, what Bolan really do this year is we actually um, do the new marketing plan, and then we uh, actually announce 
and tell tell the world what we're doing with our work and what our sustainable philosophy are. Sounds great. Um, tell us a little bit more about Boland Grocer. I mean, I mean, so what what sort of groceries have you got? Where where you where you source them from? Um, particular farmers and small holdings that you're dealing with. I'd be really interested to know a bit more. Right. So with the Boland Grocers, we we work with like small artisan producers everywhere in Thailand. So like we have like fish sauce, palm sugar, salt. Like if you see at the back there, it's the fish sauce that we've been using for like eight years now. And then I feel like it's the time to share. We, we've been sharing that for a while now, but we haven't really announced it properly or advertised it properly. But I think it's, it's a good way to keep these artisan producers, keep going, produce really good locals, um, full of, you know, culinary heritage, and then pass it on to the next, gener next generation within their communities and within Thailand as well. So we have like, Palm sugar from Samut, Song uh, Kham to the west, like to, roughly two hours drive from Bangkok to the west. And then we have the salt from different sort of Thailand. Like now, the the main one that we use is from the east side called Bang Pakong Hong Kri Food. And I feel like if people want to cook Thai food, they have to start with like a really, really good ingredient. And you don't have to like use like food enhancers from the industrialized world. Yeah, so this is what we do for Bolan. And then like the chin test, we got it from our Nam Krabi. So everywhere in Thailand, and we like to share that to preserve and pass on the culinary wisdom. That's great. Unveiling a few of the secrets from all these years. That's really, that's awesome. Um, tell me a little bit more about, about uh, I mean, Bolan's been, um, has, this, um, has this wonderful reputation for safeguarding um, uh, Thai culinary heritage but in quite a fine dining context in the past. I believe Ur is not going to be so fine dining. It's going to be much more natural. So I'd love to know a little bit more about that. And also your view on fine dining full stop. Is fine dining over? No more fine dining? For oh, Ur, the concept is because we've been doing fine dining for like six or seven years before we have Ur. And we find that it's really tedious. <laughs> we want to do something a little bit more funky, crazy, you know, like um, casual. Uh, in Thai is like an acknowledgement word that is really informal. It, it's almost like it's borderline rude. Like it, it's more like yeah, 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 whatever. Like that's er, uh, and uh, that that is what er uh, stands for. Um, but er uh, is like a sort of a street food revamp with our MSG. It's also like using the same qualities that the the qualities of the produce that we use is the same as Bolan. But it's a lot more um, approachable and affordable because a lot of people ask me like, I want to do this fire dining. I want to pass. Uh, I want to like safeguard the ingredients. I want to pass on the Thai knowledge on food. So why you make it so expensive or like food for Thai fire dining? So er is a represent of what I'm doing in a more approachable, easy understanding form that I can have fun with it as well. I feel like uh, fine dining be will become niche and niche. Um, it's probably not in that glorious day as it used to be, but I still feel like it's um, there is a part for the fine dining to to be in a society because we still have to celebrate anniversaries, birthdays, graduation, blah and blah. Yeah, so I think fine dining is still there, but it just really level intensive in general. Sounds great, sounds great. I love the borderline rude. That's, um, that's a pretty anti-establishment and, uh, and a bit more rock and roll restaurant. I love it. Um, hey, tell me a little bit about Wasteland. Wasteland's another, um, it sounds a pretty rock and roll concept too. I, I think it, it's, more, it's more sipping, it's more, it's more beverage focused, isn't it? Yes, Wasteland is a, a group of like, uh, I, I will call them like a next generation bar program people. Um, and they call that best com um, sip how do you say it? community sipping space. So it's a place where you can enjoy your drink from no proof to high HBV. But the interesting concept is they use our scraps, our off cut from the kitchen. Anything mm -hmm. that we can put in the plate, anything that we do not um, serve in, the, in food for, 
he will or they will take it and then they will like either fat wash it, um, infuse it, pickle it, um, distill it, and then centrifuge it and then turn it into a really really interesting drink. Sounds fantastic. Sounds more like bubble and squeak in a glass, actually. Um, but uh, um, zero carbon, um, zero carbon. Um, uh, let's just get onto that. It's something that you know I've, I've noticed over the years in the interviews that you've done is that zero carbon, um, creating a zero carbon footprint is a real driving force of Bolan. It's something that you crave. And I know there's been some benchmarks over the years. Uh, could you just update on um, us on the thinking on, on your thinking for zero carbon? Yeah, of course. Like I, I feel like everything that we do create carbon footprint. Yeah, like eating, cooking, buying, um, even like when we manage our waste, it creates some carbon footprint of some form. So I'm really curious, like whether I be able to measure how much we uh, produce the carbon footprint per year as a restaurant. So lucky enough, like in 2015, one of the green has greenhouse gases organization together with the university they come up with a prototype project to measure and audit how much uh, the like business released the carbon footprint and then i was applied obviously for the restaurant size and it's come out that we release about 80 tons of the footprint from our electricity use from the gas that we use to cook with papers or the coolant that was put in the aircon so that, that is a good thing to know, but then it's um, really easy to manage if you want to be a carbon neutral or zero carbon footprint restaurant. All you have to do is buy the uh, carbon credit. So we did release 80 tons in 2015, and then we bought 80 tons of uh, carbon credit, and that made Bolan a zero carbon footprint restaurant in 2015. I really never announced it. Because I don't think it's making up. Like we, we did enough to trade off all the activities that we actually create the carbon. And I want to use other activities to trade that off rather than simply buy the credit buy the carbon credit. So we come up with a lot of like, you know, upcycling programs and to trade it off. Uh, but it's good it's really good to be able to measure so I have the reference points of how much we produce. So this year, we actually come up with, um, with, with a campaign called Zero Waste to Landfill. Just because, again, I don't believe in Zero Waste and Full Stop. <laughs> Sounds great. Wow. Um, something you've obviously given a, a, lot, a lot of thought to and, um, and is, a, and is a, a, a key driving force behind the restaurant. Thanks. Um, finally, let's just um, uh, have a look at Favorite re favorite recipes? Is there anything particularly unusual that you're working on? Um, is there a is there a new season seasonal item? Um, we just, we'd just be be really interested to know um, your your thoughts on that. Right, I actually um, I actually work, working with the green tamarind pot at the moment because it's raining season and we have a lot of it uh, a lot of it um, in conjunction with the bamboo shoot. Like, um, but I I'm. I understand biodiversity and I understand like how a lot of uh, new generation chef or younger chef try to sort out something that not other chef can sort it out, like from the mountain or from the ocean, go like super hyper, like sub regions local. Um, but I, even I enjoy that and I um, appreciate the biodiversity of it, but I'm more the chef who like to find out where I can get my organic coriander and organic lemon glass. Uh, so this season, bamboo shoot and green chamber pot and see what I can do with this two things from the old cookbook. Chef Bo, co-founder of Bolan Restaurant. Thank you so much for joining us at FIST this year. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Jimmy, Chef Jimmy uh, Opost from Pro Restaurant in uh, Trisara Phuket. Um, today we at our farm um, showing one of the ecosystems we're working with uh, on our menu. Once we opened Pru, we decided, okay, can we maybe make a farm here just to grow a little bit kind of vegetables so we don't need to buy everything from the market or from import. So there's another 155, 156 rye, what is actually right now 
uh, real jungle. Uh, so, but this is also something where you can find produce, especially now when it's the raining season. You know, you have uh, you have things growing up like uh, fiddleheads, so in Thai we call it pakut. Uh, but you have bamboo shoots. What is now the season? What is just spit out the ground when it's rain? Uh, we have dala flowers. Uh, when it's rain, is a little bit less dala flowers, but uh, when it's good weather, the dala flowers growing in the nature. Uh, we have passion fruits, all these kind of things just growing into the jungle. Uh, for example, I'm looking straight into our mulberry zone right now, uh, where we have like over 200 trees of mulberries, where we make our own produce, our own jam, vinegars from the mulberries. Behind us, we have our organic ducks, where we get only the eggs from. Uh, of course, we don't kill animals right here. So we use only the eggs. But if you're looking for the small scale farmers, what put their love and their passion into their products, and you know they grow just a small variety, but they do it with love, and they make sure that what they grow is perfect and good enough to sell in a Michelin star restaurant, for example, with us. So by doing that, we also try to help them. As we see that the product is good, we are willing to put our effort in their products, and you know pay a higher price for their product to make sure that the farmers will survive. And they see that you know oh, when I make when I make something what is better than they get from overseas, they're willing to pay me more. Okay, so another thing about working with local produce, you know, is working with the seasons. Of course, everybody says working with the seasons, working with the seasons in Europe, but to do it really working with the season is also understanding what's growing in the season. So for example, you can eat strawberries whole year, but this strawberries, to grow this strawberries whole year, you need a lot of energy and all this energy will case you know, global warming, for example, that is one of the problems what you're going to get if you're going to grow strawberries when they're not meant to grow. So on the other hand, by having all these problems and solutions, so one of the solutions by using the local ingredients, you supporting the local employment. Right now, a lot of people have has lost their job, uh, unfortunately, but you know, having these farms, supporting these farmers, you know, maybe the people who worked in the hotel before but want to look, do something else right now, they may be thinking about, oh, you know, if I grow something like this, what is amazing, you know, people like this, they maybe want to buy it from me. So maybe they find, you know, the, the, new, the new job, the new passion, and creating these new jobs for people, you know, maybe it's help also the, the local community building and growing and make sure that they can survive during these difficult times. Our farm is 100% organic. But we need to feed the trees, we need to feed the plants. So we have a different kind of food waste, you know. So some of, it, some of the food waste go to staff meals, some of the food waste, we make our own compost. What we turn into our natural fertilizer to feed the trees in our farm. And I think that is also the time right now for people in Phuket, especially hotels in Phuket, to take a change. Right now, most of the hotels kind of quiet, I guess, I'm sure. So maybe it's time to maybe put a few headcounts of your staff, turn them into extra purchasing guys, or how you want to call them, local, local discovery ingredient guys, but find the staff and put them on a way where they kind of discover what can be found locally instead of have to import. So for example, I discovered a tomato farm in my cow. This is the best tomato I've ever eaten in Thailand. And this has come from 10 kilometers from outside my restaurant. So why should you import a tomato from Europe? What is maybe better than the tomato grown in Thailand? But I think doing this, you have to adjust your cooking skills a little bit. So, you know, you can use this tomato from here because honestly, it tastes amazing. So why not importing it? Why not? sourcing it locally instead of importing it. So I think hotels, put a few headcounts on it. Go and find these ingredients because they here. We have done it for four years. We have built the relationships with people over the past four years. And I know that the past six months have been very tough for the farmers because we couldn't open the restaurant, so we could not support them. But right now we're back and we try to support them wherever we can. But only us, Maybe it doesn't make a big difference for the local community. And especially now we have to think about all the problems what we have in the world and supporting the local community. 
try to find it locally first. Of course, if you want to import it, you can, but I think everything what you're looking for is here. Or let's say 90% of what you're looking for is here. So try to find it here. We have invested in an R&D team, our research and development team, in the beginning of this year. Uh, this team is traveling across Thailand to, smart, to find small-scale farmers. We like to work with small-scale farmers because, first of all, they kind of artisans. You know, they really love what they do and they really give the passion for their products. Second of all, we work with small-scale farmers because we have a close relationship with them. So we can give them feedback. Oh, you know, my lamb, I, we have an organic lamb farm, the only certified organic lamb farm in Ratchaburi. So last week we ordered the lamb, but it was too young. So for this one, we give them feedback. Okay, we wanted to have it maybe one month older, it should have maybe less milk, but maybe give it a little bit more, more grass or something like this. So the meat of the lamb is going to be more, more flavorful. This kind of things we try to help the farmers. So when we help them with our comments and they adjust to our comments, you know, and they make a better product. A better product, it means a higher price. And we're much more than happy to pay. Finding also very important the unknown ingredients for us. Because when we create a menu, we want to put something on the menu what, for example, I have never seen before. I have never tasted before. That's keep me excited. That's keep me creative. But it's also keep our guests coming back because they find something excited. And that's why I think it's very important that we all support this kind of farmers to make sure that they will survive and make sure they have something to eat and make sure they continue to keep doing this and continue to make better products. I think that is one of the most important things what I have discovered and understand about this beef farmer in a company. So a few other ideas how we can execute this ideas in helping uh, local community and uh, doing this. So I think first of all, what I said, helping the local community, helping the local skill farmers is very important. The chefs, us, other chefs, anyone on this island in this country can play a very big role in this. Because of course, we the chefs, we decide what we put on the menu. We decide what we're gonna order. We decide where we're gonna order it from. So please think twice before you order something from import and have somebody looking into the local produce, what is available on hand. So instead of complaining the guy, give them the comment. What, you lo what you're looking for, how they can improve the products or what you want to have a little bit more ripe or you want to have this pineapple a little bit bigger or you want to have it more sweet or you want to have the tomato green or you want to have the tomato red. You know, give them the advice on how they can improve the farming and the week after or the day after order it again and then see again what they do if it's if it's get better and by helping the farmers getting better the produce get better your food get better in the end foods get better that's what you're looking for because when the foods get better the guests are willing to come back more often because they see your restaurant is evolving and you're creating better food and that's what the guests in the end are looking for James Noble, founder of Boutique Farmers. Welcome, um, James. We've got James here today, and James is going to tell us as it is, all the way from West London to Chiang Mai via Prambury and uh, numerous other places in Thailand on the way um, uh, as, as, he's, as he's been traveling. Um, founder of Boutique Farmers, co-founder of the Origin Project in collaboration with Banyan Tree in Chiang Mai. James, pleasure to have you with us. Dave, it's always a pleasure, mate. Oh, excellent, I'm, excellent. You know, so, what, what, thank you what, for what, getting what, me what, out of bed? Uh, very welcome. What have you got behind you there? You, are you in the kitchen? Some yeah, micro, micro greens, marijuana, my, micro marijuana, and a, and a little bit of uh, hemp. No, no, these are garnishes that we grow uh, in our kitchen from the farm, so we can just cut and use as and when we need it. So it's, we don't waste anything by pre-cutting. Sounds great. So let me just get this clear on um, uh, exactly what you're doing on the Origin Project. You're organically growing non-indigenous crops for Michelin restaurants and other restaurants in Thailand. Is that right? Yeah, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinvent farming, basically. Farming's always been an issue with cash flow. Anywhere around the world, you'll never, uh, you, you, you never find a happy farmer because there's either too much rain or too much sun or not enough this or not enough that. You can, you're in danger of losing crops really quickly through Mother Nature. Uh, so we've tried to reinvent farming by doing it on a retained basis. So it's a business model where people from restaurants, hotels, even 
basic families can rent space on my farm, we'll farm for them. They get the glory of being farmers without getting hot and dirty. And we grow products that uh, are European based, uh, but we've grown them five times um, on our farm consistently and correctly, which then makes it an indigenous product to us. And, and we'll give them a list of all the things that we can grow. Um, and then we'll do some research and development for them for the things that they want. So what? So, I mean, so, 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 so what about the quality then? Um, you know, can you get comparable quality for um, for the um, uh, for the um, kind of non-indigenous or the indigenous to Europe products that you're? The, I, the, I, the, I, I, I honestly think, and I'm a chef, and, and 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 I use those products in my own restaurant, and you know, uh, we get genuine feedback. Our, our restaurant is a is a place to research and develop our products with the customer. I honestly think our product is on par if not better there's no suspension there's no there's no you know if you're getting a product from europe it's put into suspension so it can get here and arrive you know at the at the, at the desired ripeness no there's none of that there's no chemicals involved in in suspending products so you are you're getting straight from the vine straight from the ground straight to the table or straight to the kitchen um, and I, I honestly think you can taste the difference without with no air miles in it so how long, how long, have you, how long has the um, uh, Origin project been going for? Um, it feels like forever. I'm shorter than I was when I started. Uh, I, I've lost a fair bit of hair and what I've got left to turn grey. Uh, nine months we've nine been months. operating the product. And, 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 and you have, um, uh, and you have a, a range of uh, customers there who, who, who've got tunnels. Um, t t just tell me a little bit about that. Some, some, of, the, some of the restaurants that you're supplying what, and what sort of stuff are you supplying to them? Okay, so the industry, as you know, and everyone knows, is very small, right? So we, we, we don't offer any special rates to larger chain restaurants or bigger hotels with more keys. Rate parity. If you want to rent on our farm, it's a, it's a standard rate, whoever you are. Um, and that, whether you've got one Michelin star, two Michelin stars, or it's just a family who wants to grow their own veg uh, and, and hang out at the weekends with some soil between their toes. We have, in total, in collaboration, nine current Michelin stars on our farm. So we, we would deem ourselves as a Michelin farm because uh, we grow for nine stars. Uh, we have a, a famous salad restaurant chain in Bangkok that are, are opening two or three different uh, outlets a year. So we grow for them as well. Um, and when, then we grow for hotels such as the Banyan Tree Group uh, and export into the Maldives for them because everything has to be imported into the Maldives because obviously they don't have any growing space. So it might as well come from provenance source. So we, we grow all our own stuff for the Banyan Tree Group as well. So there's, there's some interesting restaurants, Suring Brothers, uh, Ahan, different kind of culinary experiences, not just Thai, European, mixed, French, Italians, the Capellas, the, the Four Seasons of the world, they're all with us. Sounds like a hard yard. How hard's it been? Mate. Never combine restaurants with farming because all I need is a milk ground and then I've been working 24 hours a day. You know, I mean, we're starting, we're starting farming at 5 6 o'clock, trying to get up on the land before the sun does. And then when the sun goes down, here I am rattling pots and pans, cooking my own ingredients. It's tough, but yeah. the, the rewards outweigh, you know, the, the, the effort by far. Mm -hmm. Any, any, any particular learnings along the way? Uh, you, you've fallen, I'm sure you've sort of, you know, you've fallen, fallen on your face a couple of times, you pick yourself up and then yeah, I've spent, think, why I've should spent, I do that? I've probably wasted about 150,000 baht on corn seeds because they watched, you know, they watched the non-local plant corn seeds way before he should. No one didn't, no one wanted to tell me because it was quite funny. Uh, and the next thing you know, my corn's growing down as opposed to up, and and and, and I've wasted a lot of money on corn seeding. I've learned how, I've learned to listen to locals for sure, for sure, because they know weather trends and they know soil analysis, and you know, so it's it's, it's a community thing. You get to learn you get to learn the hard way, but you don't do it twice. And what and what what is it? Just give, give some of the examples of some of the more I don't know some of the more uh, unusual or some of the, of, of some of the um uh, of the types of crops that you're growing for some of you at some of the restaurants. Yeah, some of the, I mean, some of the restaurants do ask for the, I mean, chefs, I'm one, you know, I, I want, I want the best of everything and I want it yesterday, right? So they can't really get away with too much with me because I know their, their mentality, but things like 
Madagascan vanilla. We have vanilla vines growing. We have uh, finger limes growing, Australian finger limes growing. Uh, we have figs, Israeli, Australian figs. Uh, I've got currently eight and a half thousand tomato plants growing with a 12 to 15 mixed heirloom varieties of tomatoes on the vine. Uh, it's, it's just really quite interesting. And then obviously going over into products that have been forgotten, products that we don't use anymore because they've come out of trend or they're not in fashion anymore. So we're trying to relight really those as well. Are there any particular um, uh, Thai crops that have, have been um, uh, have been forgotten, or you're or you're looking at um, different ways of growing them? Yeah, we've uh, we've managed to successfully grow black turmeric, which okay. is quite an achievement. Uh, seriously, I get my kicks from the weirdest and the smallest things now, David. Now I've you know past forty five. You know, and black, yippee, look and at black, me, black and, turmeric. And black turmeric. Um, that, that's that's used for what? Excuse my no, ignorance. Mate. Prima donna chefs like me will use it for all sorts, and I charge really loads of money for it. But things like tar fale john, which is a, a, a medicinal herb that can be used, uh, that's only grown in the wild. We managed to cultivate that and grow it on our farm. Um, some really interesting um, you know, Thai, Thai, Thai herbs that are coming back into fashion again. Um, and and so lots of restaurants like 8020 in Bangkok um, have asked us to go out and research forgotten historical herbs and bring them back to the plate. Uh, they have space on our farm and, and, and really go hard on Thai indigenous product. Oh, that's fascinating. So you're, also, so you're also very much getting into Thai indigenous product and not, and be, but you, you started off with, with non-indigenous, but, yeah. but there's a, it, it's, it's, it's expanded. Um, that's great. Um, Hey, so what's next? I mean, um, I, know, I, know, I know when we were, we, were, we were talking some time ago about, um, you know, what's the next thing? What's the next? Okay, black turmeric. Okay, that's interesting. Um, you know, what, what, I mean, uh, what is it? Medicinal, you know? Um, what, what's, Absolutely. What, what's, what's uh, the, the, the key to farming is to be slightly ahead of the curve, right? So you kind of look at trends, and we, but when trends come, you've got a 90 day growth cycle. So you're all of a sudden going, damn, I wish I was ahead of the game in that. And you know, when people are looking for it, they come to the Origins Farm, you know, the gourmet farm and we'll have it growing and they'll go, oh, I want some of that. So we're growing medicinal, um, medicinal herbs to make tonics, to make balms, to make uh, um, interesting items on the plate. So if you had an ailment, of this, that, and the other, you could you could phone us up and we'd mix you a five day tonic to build your immune system or or, or to, to get your blood circulation or a digestive problem. We'll we'll mix you aged old herbal remedies made from grown from uh, existing products that, that have been forgotten. We'll mix them up and we'll send them to you in the post. You'll have a five day shot of 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 a tonic that's mixed purely for you. That's fascinating. Are, they, are, they, are, they, are these all grown in tunnels, or or, or some of them are, some of them are, are outdoors? No, some of these are massive. Are... Some of these are massive trees. I mean, crikey! If you're growing cinnamon, like we're growing cinnamon, cinnamon trees can, you know, almost a bloody great giant could come down from one with a group golden egg. It's that big, you know. Um, and the, <laughs> so some of it grows outside. Some of it's a bit more delicate, needs to grow inside. Some of it is permacultured so we have a, a, a male and a female plant there and a sacrificial plant there um, we have indigenous ways of growing uh, traditional methods we have controlled methods we have aquaponic methods if we're going to try and grow something uh, that, that grows in water like uh, pennywort and stuff like that so we have lots of different ways of, of growing certain things that you know need certain Climate or so. Yeah, well, you've you've, cer you've certainly got plenty of space to, um, uh, to 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 work to work with. How 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 big's the Origins project? Five hundred rye. Uh, let me tell you, if you get to where you get to and you forgot the milk, you forgot the milk. You ain't going okay. back to get the milk. Let me rid of that. Hey, so t so tell me, James, um, as a as a as a chef, so favorite recipe, favorite recipe, indigenous, favorite recipe, non-indigenous that no, you have that you that, that you're growing at the currently. We, 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 we don't just grow product, we rear animals. So on our, on our restaurant, Waiting for May only uses our own reared products. So we'll use our own chickens, we'll use our own ducks, we'll use our own geese, we'll use our own pigs, we'll use cow, our own beef. 
Um, and then we have wild boar and wild chicken that run around our farm that we will catch for waiting for May. The, we like to use, it's been done a thousand times and I'm trying to find a better way of doing it. Uh, nose to tail, teeth to testicle. I mean, whatever you want to call it, we, we try and use everything. Um, so currently on our menu, we have uh, pastrami of beef tongue. So we beef tongue, we'll, we'll take 14 to 20 days to pastrami the beef tongue. And we serve that with beetroots. Now we have candied beetroots, rainbow beetroots, golden beetroots. And we'll serve that with puree of beetroot, pickle of beetroot, and, the, and maybe a carpaccio of beetroot. Um, so we do sort of try and highlight certain items that are very good for you. So we don't really have a non-indigenous and an indigenous uh, menu. We, we, we try and, it's, it's seasonal, it's what's available, it's what your grandmother used to do when you had nothing in, she'd open the fridge and make you, you know, what was available and creative. So that's, yeah. what we, that's kind of what we do. But we do have a great tomato, uh, fig and buffalo curd bruschetta. Uh, and, that, and we try desperately to have dishes on our menu that have, been completely designed with entirely 100% origin farm product. Sounds great. You can't get that in the post, I presume. Um, we've had a go with grab, um, uh, and we, we tried to deliver somebody something with grab, and it just turned up with a plate of mess. <laughs> Presentation's <laughs> okay. the key. Grab needs um, to learn. Just, 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 just before you before, before you go, James. Um, I'm just wondering about, about hotels, urban hotels, you know, hotels that really got very little space. What, was, what sort of advice would you give to them? Because they, they, they want to create more organic produce for their, um, uh, for, for their, for their restaurants. What, 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 can, what can they do? Don't do it. Don't, 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 don't try and put a little farm on the roof. It makes no sense. You've got so much carbon in the air that you're never going to be organic. You can be organic in principle, but you don't know what's falling and what's, what's, what's around you. What you need to do is to have a retained farmer outside of town that will grow specific items for you. Use that as your sales and marketing. Use that as provenance. Use that as transparency and journey. And let a professional do it for you. Because honestly, gardeners are not farmers. Right? Just because you can cut a hedge doesn't mean you can grow a carrot. Let the professionals do it. And let us bring it in from the country on a sustainable method, which is to train. We, we, we deliver only by train, ready or not that train is going. And we load our products overnight from Chiang Mai into Bangkok on the overnight train. James Noble, founder <laughs> of Boutique Farmers, co-founder Origin Farm Project with Banyan Tree in Chiang Mai. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, man. Jason Friedman, Managing Director, J.M. Friedman and Co. A very warm welcome to you today. Nice to see you. Uh, good to see you too. Um, uh, Farm to Fork fanatic behind many of the most outstanding and award-winning projects, if I may say so, Jason. Um, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Shintamani Wild. We're going to talk about Rosewood Lawn Prabang. And we're going to talk about Phu Chai Sai in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the north of Thailand, which I believe... That's where you are at the moment, Jason. Tell us a little bit about where you are. Um, I'm actually up here on, at Puchai Sai. Um, we're up in the Golden Triangle of Northern Thailand in Chiang Rai province. Uh, just behind me here is Doi Chung, uh, and the mountain where uh, those boys were trapped in the cave. And over yonder here is the Burmese border. And just over yonder here is the Laotian border. So we're about as far north in Thailand as you can get. Uh, in this gorgeous mountainous area. And I'm at a property called Puchai Sai, which is this gorgeous 33 uh, room bamboo hotel on 800 acres of wilderness here in the jungle. Uh, next year is gonna be our 20th anniversary that we've been operating Puchai Sai and the organic estate that we are. Um, Sounds amazing. Think, you know, it's, it's a remarkable visionary, uh, you know, endeavor by Mom Da, a, um, a member, you know, a member of the royal family. Um, she's been up here for over 20 years now, protecting this beautiful piece of land as an organic estate, building reservoirs, retaining water, doing farming, and finding work opportunities 
for the local community. And when I mean local community, it's, it's the six different hill tribes that we have in, in the region as our neighbors. And we very much become a, a place where these kids can get their first jobs in hospitality and have an opportunity to move out of agriculture and into hospitality. And uh, we're, we're 20 years old this year and we're, we're quite excited of how successful it's been. Uh, sounds brilliant, sounds brilliant. Let's talk a little bit about the, the organic estate and the farming. I hear you've been um, uh, planting some artisanal crops lately. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, as, as an organic property, a lot of people, you know, want organic produce and there's not a lot of big organic properties about. So uh, aside from, you know, planting long, long, you know, for essential oils and, you know, long, long is a vining plant that takes about seven years in forest to grow. We have great property to do that. Uh, we do a lot of seasonal crops, but most recently we've been uh, planting coffee on our 500 rye over my shoulder here. And uh, we have a mature uh, rubber plantation there and we're planting coffee amongst the rubber because coffee likes shade. And all of that coffee plantation will be managed by our neighboring hill tribes. And we're actually building a coffee shop in that plantation. It's got one of the most beautiful views in all of Chiang Rai. And all the proceeds of that coffee shop will go to uh, community projects that we're doing with our neighboring hill tribes. That sounds fantastic. Coffee, how hard is it to grow coffee? Um, and any particular reason why coffee? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is the district particularly good? Is the soil good? I mean, tell us a bit about that. You know, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's not easy to grow coffee. Um, it's very hard to grow good coffee. And, you know, the northern high altitude climates and uh, really verdant soil are idyllic coffee growing conditions up here in the north especially when you have a big canopy cover of forest or, 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 or even um, rubber plantation, you know, old rubber plantation trees. So we have the right climate, we have the right soil, we have the right conditions for growing really good Arabica coffee up here. Mm. Um, and we, want, we love doing projects that benefit the community because mm. that's why Puchai Sai exists, to benefit I'm, the I'm, local I'm, community. Uh, which is which is brilliant. How are you also integrating that in, into the guest experience? What can guests do? I mean, are you, are you getting the, um, uh, the, the people who stay with you involved in that in that process too? Um, absolutely. You know, we have we have a th we have 800 acres of land up here uh, directly uh, under our management, and all of that is organic. We have 27 kilometers of hiking trails on the property. We have the coffee plantation. We have a tea plantation. We have an organic farm. We have. Uh, you know, mango plum plantations. We have so many different things going on here in the property with different harvests happening throughout the year. And all of our guests are invited to enjoy the property with us when they come. Yapuchai Sai is one of those few places where once you arrive, you don't have to get into a car again to do activities because you can just walk to everything along the estate. Uh, sounds great. What, what sort of, um, uh, I mean, Thai farm products, I mean, what sort of other project? What what sort of other products are a bit undervalued? I mean, and what what would you recommend for some other hotels to to look at um, uh, uh, propagating uh, and, uh, and and growing? You know, um, every hotel should take a piece of land that they have, and whether it's a garden or a front lawn or a rooftop, and find a way to propagate something. You know, and whether it's it's, it's, a, it's an herb garden, whether you're doing some mint for the spa or you're going a bit deeper and doing hydroponic vegetables. Every hotel has the opportunity to provide something grown on their property into their facility, in the spa, in the bar, in, in the restaurants. Um, and, and, and what type of produce that is, is going to be dependent upon what the hotel, where they are, what their climate is, and how much land they have. But what I do know is every hotel has the ability to grow produce, every hotel should be growing produce. Yeah, that's brilliant. Hey, let, let's, let's go to your, to your left a little bit. Let's go up to Laos. I know you're doing um, uh, work uh, with, 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 with the Rosewood. That's, that's, there you go, left. Um, uh, with Rosewood <laughs> in, in, in Luang Prabang. I mean, these, these are obviously challenging times because, because no one can cross borders. Um, um, how are you um, 
still ensuring that, that the Rosewood and Laundra Bank is, um, is, is doing okay? And how are you maintaining that farm to fork um, you know, community uh, presence and, um, and storyline? Well, you know, the, um, from, the, from the beginning, when we opened Rosewood Luan Prabang, uh, the farm to table, our, our local produce into the restaurant was the core element of that restaurant. And without guests, we decided that we wanted those farms to keep producing. So we've continued to finance the farming operations with all of that produce going to our staff that aren't working at the moment. Uh, we've also done that at our Shintamani properties in Cambodia. So we have found a way to keep our farms, our hotel farms, producing for the community. Um, but you know, also we, we understanding that we're most likely not gonna see normalization in international travel until you know, third or fourth quarter of 2021, we've been coming up with very creative ways to find uh, ways to bring the local community into our hotels. So we've been planning very interesting um, monthly events, you know, wine and food events uh, that uh, are very unique for Luang Prabang. And they are a way to attract folks from Vientiane to drive on up, maybe a Range Rover rally along the way to come and enjoy a unique food event up at our property. Um, and so far the response has been very good to it because mm. we've been making the effort to create unique creative events for our clients. And even if it's just for a weekend, we so, we're I mean, to I'm, go through that effort. With so much talk about farm to fork uh, at the moment, farm to table, whatever you call it, I'm a crop to cup in terms of, um, uh, of, coffee, of coffee potentially. Is, is fine dining, is fine dining gone? Is fine dining over? Are people fine dining still? Or are they just, are those fine dining experiences being defined more by, by the crops and what's being, what's being artisanally grown around the property? Well, you know, you know I, I don't think fine dining will ever go by the wayside, but it's not gonna be, you know, the premier anchor style of dining that it once was. You know, we all love a, 13 course Alan Ducasse, you know, operatic meal, you know, every so often. But, you know, what we see so much more, people want a bit more uh, casual dining, a casual experience, and people want to eat produce from the land. They want to eat something that came from here or here or here. You know, 20 years ago when I was in Bali, it was a cool thing to fly in your tomatoes from Italy and your, your spinach from New Zealand but it's not unique anymore. It's not a special thing to be able to fly produce in. People are more interested now in what have you produced next to the restaurant? What did you produce and source down the road? That's the ultimate luxury fine dining experience when everything is sourced locally and prepared in a very respectful way and served with great service. For that's me, brilliant. that's where fine dining is now. Thank you, Jason. Um, got one final question for you. Um, so, what's so what's what's your favorite your favorite favorite dish that you can get from just the garden behind you? you know, what is what 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 what's the, what, what, what's the best that, that you're growing at the moment? Well, yeah, you know, my my favorite dish is whatever we happen to have, you know, seasonally coming out of the farms. You know, I I, I come up here once a month and I, I walk the property. I go to the local markets, and there's always different stuff around. Mm. And that's the real joy of it. And if we're having a bumper crop, you know, we, we put out a notice on our website. We let people know we have, we have mango plums, we have asparagus, and we'll ship it to you anywhere in Thailand. So I, I can't say I have a favorite because it usually depends on what's happening right now. And that's yeah. the beauty of Farm to Fork. It's Fantastic. a real special menu. That's excellent. Jason Friedman, Managing Director, JM Friedman and Co. Thanks so much for joining us. Right, next up, we've got Bill Barnett. Bill Barnett, um, uh, are, you, are you ready to wrap this session up for us, Farm to Fork? Bill. Hi, David, we're ready and we're rolling. I don't have a Hawaiian shirt like Eric Ricotti. David, here's some words for you, right? Michelin, Michelin, right? Okay, you got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's something for you. With you. Today, we're gonna, I'm trying to wrap this session up. And you know, to me, Farm to Fork is one of the most exciting spaces out there. You know, it's really important, you know, in terms of, you know, how hotels are doing this. So in terms of, you know, when we're thinking about farm to fork, uh, you know, what are those ideas out there? I've kind of 
you, you know, given a hit list of what those ideas are, certainly in terms of that, you know, it's, it's going to be fresh. So I think that's really important. Again, you know, you, you're getting things which you're not shipping to from other places. So it's environmentally friendly in terms of shipping. You know, that's always important because you're not having jets fly things in. You're not using that. There's a good footprint. You're getting things locally in terms of that. One thing is about the menu. You, you know, you're not eating one of these fucking club sandwiches or something else from a Marriott, but you're having a menu which is changing as the season changes, as what's available. It turns cooks into chefs. It, it, it creates that innovative process. Again, I think that's really important because who wants to go to a restaurant and eat the same thing every day? So it offers that opportunity. You, you know, certainly low food costs for hotels. I was talking to somebody yesterday with a farm to table restaurant in a hotel and they're talking about an 18% food cost because again, you're not filling your storerooms with things you're importing from foreign countries. You're not sitting on these goods. You know, when I was a hotel GM, you'd always go back in that storeroom and you go back to the refrigerator and start reaching find the, you know, you'd find those frozen tunas from four years ago and everything else. You're chucking them out, but it's a healthy process as well. I think certainly for hotels, you know, farm table makes absolute sense because you're regenerating your menus. You're creating a great USP for your restaurants too, because it's not the same thing every day. You know, and post COVID has been certainly important for us, you know, when we're seeing what are the new experiences and whether it's urban farming, we're looking at a picture now of urban farming. You know, what can you do in the city as well? You don't need a lot of space with hydroponics and having these roof spaces as well. That's important. You know, rooftop farming is certainly, we're seeing Chula Longhorn University in Bangkok become one of the largest rooftop farming installations in the world. It's an amazing installation. Again, it sets a pattern of what can be done in our cities as well. If you don't necessarily have to go, to go to the farm, you don't necessarily have to leave the city. And I think that's really important as well. You know, certainly when we go on to farm to, farm to hotel experiences and saying, what can people do in your hotel? It's not just about putting a sun lounger out and doing things. If you've got kids, anybody who has kids, you know, uh, God help you because you know what you've got to have for a family holiday. What are you going to do with the kids the whole day? And those farming adventures and where you're educational and you're learning things, that's another high USP for hotels as well because you've got people learning, you've got people experiencing things down on the farm as well. And there's that connection of what you're eating also because you're seeing the whole trail of what you're seeing out there on the farm is you're going to be experiencing in the restaurants as well. So there's a connection to that. So I think that's really important as well. You know, we, as far as, you know, kitchen dining, creating small herb gardens, everything else, we're seeing more and more of this, even in urban settings or the smallest of settings, there's great opportunities. So that's another good experience well, as well. You know, we've talked about, Jason before was talking about coffee, another great little niche in terms of what can you be producing here? I was at the Kimpton Hotel the other day in Bangkok, and they've got the coffee connoisseur. He's saying, here's all these great coffees from Thailand. You know, it took me 20 minutes to order a latte. It was a great experience, though, because it's local and everything else. I've got Eric coming up, so I know we're almost out of time here. So uh, let's rush through. Farming is a, it's a gesture of hope. You know, it's something where you're being inspired. I watched a movie called The, Big Li the Biggest Little Farm, and that's a great documentary to watch because it inspires thinking. I think it's something so important. So today we've learned a lot from our chefs there, and I think this movement's going to continue on because it's the greatest thing from COVID-19 is having green shoots and learnings from this experience. David, over to you. Thanks very much, Bill. Awesome. I'm just going to say, uh, Chef Bo, Chef Jimmy, excuse the, the audio on Chef Jimmy. You'll be able to um, uh, check it out the recording there, though. He's got some great stuff to say. Jason Friedman, uh, James Noble. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. David, don't Bill, forget this. Michelin, Michelin, okay? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, get back to the club. we'll get back to the club sandwich later, too. Okay, um, Eric, over to you.